in talking about peptides, um, there are some biologically active peptides. So these are peptides that are found physiologically that have roles in kind of maintaining um, cellular processes or in physiologic processes in the body. So enkephalins are pentapeptides, meaning that they have five amino acids. And these are made in the brain and they act as um, natural painkillers and sedatives. So basically the way they work is they bind to what are called nociceptors or pain receptors in the brain. And whenever those nociceptors um, are bound by the enkephalins, those receptors can no longer receive like the regular type of pain signal from them. So by default, they kind of block the body's, be able, the body's ability to sense pain. Um, drugs like morphine and heroin are addictive drugs that bind to those same pain receptors. Um, they produce a similar physiologic response in terms of blocking the pain, and they have a much more longer lasting effect. And that's one of the reasons why um, a lot of people become addicted to these drugs, because they have that longer lasting effect. Um, people don't feel pain. It kind of takes them away from kind of that any kind of pain they might be feeling, and that can be both uh, physical pain and also psychological pain as well. Um, however, those addictive drugs have a lot of other uh, negative side effects and consequences beyond the fact that um, they're just very addictive. So that's why we try to stay away from those. And they're even um, like in a hospital or something, there's alternatives to, say, morphine nowadays that are commonly prescribed. So here's the structure of one of these uh, enkephalins. This one's called MET enkephalin. So the MET refers to the fact that the C-terminal amino acid over here is going to be a methionine. So you can see the sequence of this MET enkephalin is going to be tyrosine, glycine, glycine, phenylalanine, and then the methionine that is your C-terminal amino acid. So tyrosine would be your N-terminal amino acid, the N-terminal. And then methionine would be the C-terminal amino acid. So you always write amino acids from N-terminus on the left to C-terminus on the right. That's just a common designation. So if we were trying just to identify these, right, this right there would be your tyrosine. Then you would have two glycines in a row. Um, so here's one glycine. Here's another glycine. And then after that, you would have your phenylalanine. Whoops, wrong button. You have your phenylalanine here, and then the methionine would be the one in red over here at the end, right? So those are your kind of five individual amino acids that make up one of these enkephalins. So leuenkephalin is really the same thing. You have that same kind of backbone with the tyrosine, glycine, glycine, phenylalanine. The only difference here, instead of methionine at your C-terminus, now you have a leucine. So again, you don't really need to know the difference, that like the specific difference between them. Just I'm using this as an example to show you some um, naturally occurring peptides. Uh, a couple other uh, naturally occurring peptides, oxytocin and vasopressin. So these are cyclic peptide hormones. So again, a hormone is something that's made in one organ, um, released, travels through the bloodstream, and has an effect somewhere else. So they have very similar sequences to each other, with the exception of two different amino acids. So these are cyclic peptide hormones. In other words, they form a ring. Um, and this is going to be the first time that we actually see this disulfide bond. So if you remember, whenever we were looking at our amino acids earlier, we said disulfide bonds occur between cysteines. So the way this works is you have your N-terminal amino acid is going to be the cysteine on the upper left-hand corner. Right? So there's your N-terminal cysteine. So you kind of read this as cysteine, then tyrosine, then isoleucine. That's the ILE that's here then glutamine, asparagine, cysteine, proline, leucine, and then you have another glycine on the end here. Now, the interesting part to this is that the ring forms between these two cysteines through this disulfide bond, which is a covalent linkage between the two. So instead of that cysteine having a free SH, so basically a cysteine usually has an SH bond. Right? So what happens is if two cysteine, so I'll just write like cysteine with an SH bond. Let's say you have another cysteine over here that has an SH bond next to it. 
Whenever you get two cysteines that are close to each other like that, what can happen is you have your cysteine that forms an SS with a cysteine. Um, so basically, it's, a, it's actually a redox reaction. So the one on the bottom here is going to be reduced. It has the extra has the extra H. Remember, reduction is gaining. So reduction would be gaining a hydrogen. So it gains uh, these extra hydrogens here, that hydrogen and that one. And then the oxidized one would be the one up top. So this one up here would be oxidized. So again, that same terminology we learned um, way back when on redox reactions come to play in here in proteins and amino acids and peptides as well. Um, so oxytocin and vasopressin are very similar to each other. Um, going back to the physiology of it, the only difference between them is going to be this isoleucine and leucine. If you compare it to vasopressin, over in vasopressin, we have a phenylalanine and an arginine. So other than that, they're identical to each other. So you might ask, well, what's the big difference between having two different amino acids? Well, let's take a look. Oxytocin is involved um, in pregnancy and childbirth. So it's important for the contraction of uterine muscles. It signals for milk production um, from the mom. And this is the chemical that's often given to induce labor in a woman who's kind of overdue and she's ready to have her baby like now, or the doctor says, you're having your baby now. So oxytocin is a chemical for that. Vasopressin, only two amino acids differently in that cyclic peptide. This is an antidiuretic hormone that limits urine production in the kidneys. So basically it helps keep your body fluids up during periods of dehydration. So the point you should get from this is these are two completely different uh, chemicals in terms of their functional properties. Despite those completely different you know, chemical uh, physiologic responses, their chemical structure is very similar apart from those two amino acids that are different. So small changes in the amino acid sequence of a peptide can have a big difference in its functional role.